Hello, Stephanie. We're sitting in uh, Michael's house in Beverly Hills, and he suggested having an interview so you could add it to all the stuff that you put on the on the uh, internet. So I appreciate what you're doing, and I hope you can use some of this. Lee, do you remember what your original impetus to make music was when you were a child? I'm not sure how old you were when you first started playing the clarinet. I think that was your first instrument. Yes, at uh, 11 years old I asked and received a clarinet. Uh, I had been listening to the radio a lot, to the dance bands. That was a big impetus. Uh, my brother loved, to, my older brother loved to sing uh, spontaneously and that was always fun. Uh, sing popular songs? Mm, no. Well, sometimes, yeah. Classical. What was he Jewish? No, he was just improvising, just little popular ditties uh, of the day. But he wasn't into uh, standards or uh, anything really. Uh, He'd sing along with the radio, or just no, out in the just open burst air. into spontaneous song. Right. But your parents weren't particularly musical. Not really. No. <clears throat> there was no so it was the radio music. that. It was the radio and my mm. friends, basically. Yeah. Mm. And um, when did you first make the movement from playing a recognized song, maybe that you heard on the radio, to actually creating your own music by improvising? Well, I always had a f the first feeling I had was to improvise before I knew songs. I think we start out by just kind of playing freely, uh, investigating. You and your friends? No, just alone. I think when we pick up an instrument, any of us. We just Actually, most of people I know, they they have to have the music. You know, they first begin by learning scales. So I think that's rather unusual, actually. No, I doubt yeah, it. I really? think before uh, someone sticks the music up on the stand, they just fool around trying to place their fingers, trying to make some kind of a logical sound. And uh -huh. uh, that's the basis, I think, for, for the intrigue uh, in putting a note next to another note. So it, it sounds like swing jazz was your original inspiration, though, to get yeah. into music. Uh, uh, Is there any particular um, orchestra, jazz band for, that you recall that had uh, a Benny Goodman effect? was one of the big uh, influences. See, I never heard that before. I was a clarinet player. Really? Why I wanted the clarinet, etc. But I was listening to a lot of the bands were recording from uh, doing remotes from ballrooms around the country. And so uh, a lot of people uh, that I read about were doing the same thing uh, under the covers when they were supposed to be sleeping or studying, they were listening to this music. Well, I, I think Benny Goodman's probably a great model. I don't know his music very well, but the little bit that I've heard, I've been amazed at how musical he is because sometimes his reputation is more of a popular figure than a great jazz musician, at least to someone from my generation. You know, I'm 42. So that's very interesting. Later on, did he remain one of your favorite clarinet players, or did you like Artie, Artie Shaw more, or any other player? Well, I, I uh, like some other clarinet players better, actually. I, I do like Artie Shaw. Uh, I think he's more musical in some ways than Benny. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that was an initial first love, and the first mm -hmm. love always occupies a special place. So well, I wish that person would stop yeah, coughing. I'll close. So, uh, what um, motivated you to switch from the clarinet to the saxophone? Well, I understood that uh, if I wanted to work, uh, uh, that the saxophone was the main instrument. Clarinet is what we call a double. So I uh, got a tenor saxophone from my loving parents uh, the second year, and. Uh, and then at some point, uh, I was offered a situation to play alto in a in a club with a kind of a show band, and so the alto kind of indicated to me. So it wasn't particularly you liked the sound of the saxophone better than the clarinet. It was more of a practical thing that was your. No, it started position. out practically, and then I enjoyed I playing see. saxophone more than clarinet. I see. And you went for the alto originally, not the tenor. Well, as I say, I got the tenor, and then Sorry. when I uh, took uh, 
this job on the alto, uh, the alto appealed to me more at the time. So I stayed with that one. Was it a, um, when you started playing the clarinet and the alto, did you take to them very easily? Did you have any difficulty? Or was it just a real natural thing and you just mastered the, or started mastering the instruments on a very you know, gradual but steady basis? Yeah, I studied to, uh, <coughs> steadily and mm -hmm. gradually and steadily you learn how to play. Hmm. I'm still gradually and steadily <laughs> learning how to play. I've noticed in your um, playing recently, I only get to hear you <coughs> live when you're here in LA, that there's a um, kind of a very um, floating-like ethereal sound, an emphasis maybe more on that than I've heard in the past. Um, is this a, do you recognize that or is this a conscious well, thing? Well, as I explained before, uh, playing the way uh, I suggested to the pianist and the guitarist, Alan Broadbent and Larry Coons, uh, who are doing this job with me, this five days, I wanted to play a freer version of, of tunes instead of just coming in and automatically turning on the tempo and trying to adhere to that tempo. I like kind of playing around and getting into the tune in a more subtle way. And they were, they jumped at the opportunity. And uh, my position in this, uh, if I really listen to what each guy is doing, I almost have to kind of walk on uh, eggshells to not overblow. Mm. As soon as I play a full volume and play a lot of notes, suddenly I block out the rest of the sound. And so I'm just kind of poking around, uh, looking for the right note to fit the chords I'm hearing. The, they, the chordal instruments control the whole show, uh, unless I just take over and play a lead voice and they hang on to what I'm doing, and somehow I choose to just listen and try to react to what I'm hearing around me. So I'm hearing chords, a lot of chords, and uh, trying to find, I don't know what they are as they're being played. It doesn't, a light doesn't register B flat seven altered or whatever. I'm just reacting to the sound, basically. Sometimes it fits, sometimes I wiggle out of it quickly and go chromatically into another place. And by that time, there's another chord to catch me in flight, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very touch-and-go kind of uh, discipline. And you it's intriguing to do, but uh, uh, as a result, uh, I hold back a little more maybe than I would if it were just playing straightforward. You touched upon something that reminded me of a comment you made a few years back. I once asked you, when you're playing, are you conscious of what the chords are? Or is that not even um, something you're thinking about? And your response to me was something to the effect, well, D minor 7, G7, A minor 7, D7. If, if you're thinking that, there's not much going on. Well, Would you like to elaborate on that thought? Uh, I try uh, to react to the sound that I'm hearing, and uh, it just doesn't... Uh, names, uh, uh, theoretical things uh, don't occur to me mm -hmm. at best. If they mm -hmm. do, I'm not in a real playing mode. The playing mode uh, is uh, when uh, you're open and receptive to whatever sound, even if it's a sound in the audience or whatever, that all becomes part of the music somehow to me. Mm. Uh, and so um, at this stage, after playing for all these years, I still can't just, I could if I stopped and said, well, that was a D minor G7, mm -hmm. but I really don't want to know that. Right. I just want to know that it's a, a combination of notes that makes us. I'm very curious sound. to know. Could is it just as easy for you to play a tune, say all the things you are in F sharp or B major? Is that easy for you? Well, I, uh, that's part of my daily kind of practice. Uh, so you could do you could play any <coughs> tune in any key. Yeah. Because you're reacting to what you hear. Yeah. Hmm. Um, 
you know, it's easier to play in the familiar key because I play in that key more. Right, right. But if I played for a while in the other key, it would feel familiar. To what degree when you're playing is it um, a matter of what you hear? And to what degree is it a matter of how you feel physically? For instance, the great trumpet teacher, Charlie Cullen, yeah. once said that the body is the instrument, your body is the instrument. So what I'm getting at here, I'm just curious to know how much is it of a physical feeling of how your body feels and how much of it is you know, something that you hear or something intellectual. Or is, I'm sure it's a combination, but would you like to elaborate on that? It's a combination, certainly. Uh -huh. uh, as, uh, as I'm playing uh, the other night, for example, uh, it was especially good communication with Alan when we played uh, the first set as a duet and I, I could just feel uh, like wanting to dance and wanting to, to really participate physically and to, and to kind of straighten up and loosen up and doing things that sometimes when I'm playing and, and very involved in uh, manipulating the instrument uh, I kind of might be, maybe uh, get into a, a locked physical position and and not really breathe and, and feel the full body uh, part of the music. That's what it is. Uh, we start out by feeling the music uh, internally, expressing it uh, somehow externally uh, before we choose to put it into the instrument and then hopefully uh, it's an extension of us into the instrument. We are the instrument. Uh, the other, uh, the actual instrument is just an amplification of what we're hearing. You, you have one of the most distinctive sounds in the history of jazz. And um, is there one or two saxophone players who, who sound, just their tone, I'm not talking about their conception, but just their sound, um, had a special impact on you? Johnny Hodges calling. was the first one. Really? I uh -huh. never heard that before. And um, uh, Lester Young was a major one. Even uh, though he played tenor, yeah, he could it was just transcend that difference of instrument. The purity of his sound. Uh, did you get to hear him play live frequently? I did, but I wasn't <coughs> that aware of him at the time. So it's mostly from recordings that you Yeah, used. thank God for recording. <coughs> Yeah, I sometimes feel in some ways Lester Young is the most complex rhythmically of any musician. I mean, he does some things rhythmically which are just, you know, phenomenal, I think. Well, it was 100% uh, music. Uh, there was no ego involved, no attitudes, no black and white. It was uh, pure music. And uh, Charlie Parker, uh, less in a way, there were, there were, there were some problems that came out through his music that were extra musical, but uh, at his best, uh, his sound was a, a, a great sound also. When he wasn't really overblowing and being funky and everything, that wasn't my favorite part mm -hmm. of it. But mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you ever heard him, his uh, playing with Jay McShann, that's yes. kind of where he started. That was that was pure, a beautiful yeah. sound. You um, once mentioned to me something that I don't think hardly anyone know, realizes, but it's really a fascinating story. Um, when you, at one point in the 50s, I guess, um, you told a story where Stan Kenton engaged yourself, Charlie Parker, and Dizzy Gillespie as soloists with his orchestra yeah, so on so the same performance. Yes, yeah, so I had been Could with the band for a year and a half and I went home, uh, put the band to to be with my family, and uh, he called some time later and asked me to come on tour, and I said, okay, great. I'm familiar with the band, I'm familiar with the music, so it would be a, a snap. And, and I said, who else will be on the program? He said, uh, uh, Charlie Parker. I said, what? <laughs> what uh, is happening? <laughs> well, it was a nice experience, and or it, was, uh, it was a chance for me to get to know him a little better. He. Uh, I've told a story a few times about the, him uh, asking for ten dollars once uh, at the beginning of the tour, and I gave him ten dollars. Ten dollars was a lot of money in 1952. I see. 
And uh, a week later, uh, as we were boarding the bus, I asked him for the 10. He said, just a minute. And the next guy that came up on the bus, he borrowed 10, asked <laughs> for 10, and handed I never heard of it. it. <laughs> and also, he sat with me while one of my uh, children were being born in New York when we were in Seattle, Washington, and uh, kind of uh, felt that uh, I needed a friend. Uh, and we spent the day together. Uh, it was really a very sweet gesture on his part. Oh, this, this is fascinating for people to hear because you and Charlie Parker are the two main stylists of modern jazz. So any well, interaction between the two of you is really fascinating. I uh, felt a very nice feeling uh, from him. <laughs> Another story that's uh, just occurred to me recently. Uh, a week ago was uh, March the 12th. Was uh, Charlie pa the, the anniversary of Charlie Parker's uh, death, and it was also my father's birthday. Oh. Uh, at one time, Charlie came up to me and said, "You know, your father came up to me and told me that he thought you could play better than me." And I said, uh, <laughs> "That's not possible because my father don't know who you are." <laughs> He's in Chicago. This was in New York. Bird <laughs> told me that. Well, you know, I um, remember I mentioned the story about you with Kenton to someone, and they said that they heard that the musicians were saying that in that those performances you were actually out playing Charlie Parker. Cotton Bird <laughs> was the expression, and uh, I was comfortable playing music that I had played for a year and a half, and Bird was playing new music in a strange environment, and he wasn't terribly comfortable. So the, the story goes that Dizzy said, listen, uh, the young, young guy is cutting you. <laughs> and uh, then Dizzy said, well, I regret saying that because the next night I had to follow Bird. <laughs> he played his ass off. <laughs> Do you recall if um, either of you played a ballad in, on that occasion? Yeah, we both played ballads. Mm -hmm. You don't remember specifically what tunes were yeah, played? he played uh, uh, My Funny Valentine. Really? And, uh, okay. I played Lover Man. Really? And uh, there were uh, My Funny Valentine and uh, All the Things You Are and Cherokee were arrangements written by Bill Holman for the occasion for Bird to play. Mm -hmm. And after the tour, Bird was unable to record. They asked him to record them, so I recorded those pieces. Hmm. Did Bird ever um, make any comments or compliments to your playing or yes. ask you any questions? A number of times over the years when I would meet him, he was always very gentle with me and uh, uh, mentioned uh, that he really uh, appreciated that I didn't try to play like him. At this point, you have to remember, everybody was playing like him, okay? Uh, was that a conscious decision or was it more a case where you just um, it was conscious to a uh -huh. point, uh, to a kind of a ego point, I would say, that I didn't want to get to, into the, that powerful influence. I already had a powerful influence at Lenny Tristano, and that was sustaining me, and his encouragement uh, was all I needed. Uh, but uh, you know, I was missing uh, the great music that Charlie Parker played, so. But when I was able to really study and learn some of the solos and everything and really appreciate why he was so great. Mm. I, uh, One of the most interesting recordings I ever heard, and I wish someone had had the foresight to record this, was hearing Tristano and Charlie Parker playing together. Mm -hmm. It was in, I think, some Metronome All-Star recordings, when they were both in their peak. Oh, yeah. If those two had done an album of duets, I think that would have been... because. Yeah. Charlie Parker has such a fluidity, and Tristano had more of an uh, almost a computer-like articulation, you know, very angular and very precise. And I think that contrast was exceptionally um, interesting and beautiful. Uh, there is uh, something uh, somewhere on the bootleg record, I think, of uh, Charlie Parker and, and uh, Kenny Clark, I think, went up to Tr Tristano's studio. and. Uh, Kenny played brushes on a telephone book, and Bird uh, played with Lenny a few tunes. Really? Well, I'll, uh, have to, I'll have to get that. Yeah, uh, I have it someplace. So. Right. Yeah.
uh, just to uh, speak about the, uh, the present time before we go back again. Uh, I just completed a tour before I came here to California uh, in Europe um, from uh, February the 7th through March the 14th. I played every night. Uh, there was one night off uh, uh, before the very last date in Bern, Switzerland. Uh, this was all over Europe, Eastern Europe and Western Europe. And uh, this requires traveling uh, some day, some day six hours in a van um, or a train or a car. And uh, sometimes it seems, um, you know, uh, 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 difficult. The traveling is difficult, but uh, uh, since I'm not digging ditches or doing physical labor. I'm just sitting back, maybe dozing off or reading a book or talking to guys if I'm traveling with guys, whatever. And uh, then you come to the town, you check in the hotel and rest a little bit and have something to eat and then go and play music, you know. And uh, uh, after six weeks of that, when I, I came to California, I checked in the hotel and I tell you, I just fell apart. I felt uh, I could finally let myself go and realize what a strain that really is. All of that uh, moving around is, uh, is very difficult and I feel that that's what we get paid for really, not for playing the music. Uh, it's a, a great uh, way to, to work and to, to the rewards are very great. Uh, and so I, I appreciate now that in my 71st year I can still do that pretty comfortably, but I do feel it at the end. Mm. Um, just um, to wrap up what we were talking about before, one of my favorite recordings of yours, and I, there are many I haven't heard, is the recording of Just Friends with Jack DeJanet and Dave Holland and Marshall Solo. Is that Ma how you pronounce Marshall his name? Solal. Marshall Solo on the album called Satori. Yeah. And um, this, I think, is a particularly great recording. And, of course, one of Charlie Parker's most favorite, famous recordings is Just Friends with Strings. That's yeah. one of his great masterpieces. Yeah, yeah. I came to the realization that your recording of Just Friends surpasses his well, in terms of... it's because I didn't have that schmaltzy background. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyone who hasn't heard that should definitely check out the Satori album. Okay. So another big favorite of mine is your recording of Night and Day with Red Mitchell playing piano oh, right. on the um, Cole Porter album. Oh, okay. That's one of my, I think that solo could be, um, yeah. it's just um, to check extraordinary. That yeah, that's a great one. I um, when I studied with you back in 1975, I was very surprised because at the time you were transcribing one of John Coltrane's solo. Mm -hmm. It was um, a ballad. Um, I'm trying to remember which one it was. Um, it would be a D, da, 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 Yes, da, da. right, right. Yeah. So, um, as I understand it, you're not a great fan of Coltrane's later modal period and his free jazz period, but his earlier period where he was playing within tunes and doing uh, ballads. Out of uh, Coltrane's whole uh, <coughs> <coughs> the whole history of his playing, there are many things that are, I think, great uh, of, from all the periods. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something about the intensity and the sound of his music that uh, kind of grates me in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to be in a special mood right. for that kind of experience. But it is a very special experience when, when it happens. I, I'm still talking about Lester Young and the, and the peacefulness, relative peacefulness. There doesn't seem to be any antagonism. There's no message mm. to be heard except pure music. Mm. I hear uh, many extra musical things somehow in Coltrane I frequently. See. You made that comment before when we were listening to Ben Webster play How Deep Is the Ocean and the tape in the car. Yeah. You made the comment, just music, pure music. Yeah, That's what you mean by that. It's just uh, 
all our concern is just on making the most beautiful sound we can make and uh, not proving anything more than that. That's a, a 100%, takes 100% of our attention to make that happen. After playing now for 60 years, it's still very challenging for me to play a simple melody and have it clean and touch the reed at the proper time in the proper way and release it and vibrate if I want or not vibrate, and not get the saliva in the sound and breathe comfortably, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and get all the moving parts into synchronization. That's a major uh, uh, need uh, in playing an instrument. Um, the reason I bring up Coltrane is because I believe that yourself, Charlie Parker, and John Coltrane are the three major stylists in, on saxophone in modern jazz. So I would like to ask, do you have any personal contact with Coltrane at all? I didn't. Never met him? I met him, but that was all. I didn't get to hang out with him. All the stories about Wayne Shorter and whoever, Joe Henderson and Sonny Rollins hanging out and practicing with him. Uh, I think that was a very special experience. I mm -hmm. just read an interview with Freddie Hubbard. Freddie mm -hmm. was uh, uh, close to those people, and mm -hmm. he mentioned how he spent two hours a day going from Sonny Rollins, who would say, what's Coltrane practicing, over to Coltrane <laughs> saying, what's Sonny Rollins practicing? <laughs> but we all, you know, learn from each other, and I never really hung out with guys in that way. So uh, I when, when you that. When you recorded the album Motion with Elvin Jones, did you discuss Coltrane at all with Elvin? No. no. Elvin came in at 8.30 in the morning after working with Coltrane and two basses and two tenors. And uh, we played the, the first take at 9 o'clock. It was accepted. Uh, I have a transcription of your solo from that session. I think it's um, I Remember You. Is uh, that correct? Yeah. And um, what, was what was the tempo on that? I, I don't I still have the, the tempo. Yeah, what, how fast is that? What was the tempo on that? Because uh, I have the trans. Do we, do, do we. Okay. Well, I I just like to comment here that I've um transcribed. I have a transcription of that solo, and I put it through my computer and listened to it, and um, it's just amazing how inventive and how perfectly crafted these melodies are. How original they are. And to be going at that tempo also, it's, it's just incredible. So that's I'm another not, album I would definitely I'm have I'm constantly amazed yeah. still <laughs> at the miracle of improvising. That's what's uh, uh, so intriguing uh, uh, for a whole lifetime. Because uh, in really trying to improvise, uh, I have the benefit of those surprises. Sometimes they're uh, great surprises, sometimes they're less of a surprise, sometimes uh, it's almost impossible to really, to really uh, make it work uh, effectively, but it's still a surprise. The ones that the guys who work out their solos, many of the people do that, thinking that it's naive to improvise in front of paying customers. Uh, they have the security of of knowing what they're playing and just work on playing it very well, which is a full-time job. Also, uh, I'm not saying one way is better than another. Just trying to differentiate. Are you saying they're jazz players who work jazz out their players, solos? Most jazz players work out their solo. Really? I've never heard that before. Well, the, 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 at least to the extent that they have very specific vocabulary. Well, that's that true. I, I can see what you're saying. Yeah. But uh, also yeah. working out phrases, uh, uh, you know, hmm. old sections as though they were playing etudes. Right, I see. Especially in fast tempos that are right. especially I see. difficult. I see. Um, I've been I'm deeply involved in Indian classical music the last mm -hmm. three or four years, and I've come to the realization that of all the jazz musicians in history, you are the one who has the most in common with Indian classical music. And I'm, I've tried to analyze why I've come to that conclusion. It has something to do with the convoluted nature of your lines, of the abstract nature of your lines, um, the way they turn in different directions. Mm -hmm. The Indians have a word, I think it's vacrid, it means crooked. 
Uh -huh. And to them, that gives interest to music, that it yeah, doesn't just creepy. go in straight lines. That, yeah. <laughs> um, but you've never really been influenced by any music, right? You've never listened oh, to it much? I love Indian music. Uh -huh. Very much. But I haven't studied uh, that specifically. Uh -huh. I see. I like to feel that uh, whatever I play is a result of whatever I've heard. And I listen mm -hmm. to classical music uh, very much. Uh, there's a lot of jazz that uh, I don't enjoy listening to. If I have a, a moment when I want to hear something, I might pick out the uh, Bach cello suite rather than uh, uh, Coltrane and, and that kind of intensity. I think maybe one of the greatest compliments you've ever received is, as I understand it, Bill Evans um, listed you as one of his, I think, three major influences on his music. He said that uh, I was a bigger influence to him than Lenny Tristano was, which mm. I questioned to him. Uh, I mean, since he's a piano player... Did he uh, study with Tristano? Not that I know of. Yeah. But a lot of people uh, didn't like Tristano for either personal reasons or mm. musical reasons. Um, I think uh, musical reasons. At first, Tristano's playing was kind of very heavy-handed and very stiff rhythmically, mm -hmm. but as he developed, uh, it became a phenomenal uh, uh, music mm. that uh, any any literate piano player would have to acknowledge, as a classical pianist would have to acknowledge the Goldberg variations or some standard repertoire. Right. <coughs> As long as there are people uh, trying to play music uh, uh, in a sincere way, there'll be some jazz. Who the next major voice that's going to uh, add new vocabulary, it's hard to tell after all of these years of experiencing the development and growth of music. Where do you go from here, they say. Well, you just keep playing. That's about it. And if someone, some special guy comes along and organizes it in a new way, then we'll have another approach and everybody will jump on to try to learn. Hmm. Well, we've covered a lot of material here. I think that's enough. Yeah. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, see you around. Okay. I'm sure you can edit out uh, 10 minutes of material or something.